So here we are. We're concluding our series today, message number four. Our series has been called uh, For the Love of God. Jesus comes along and he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to love your enemies, which must have landed like it does when we hear it. It's like, you know, Jesus, when, he said a lot of shocking things when he was on the earth. Some things that were very countercultural and counterintuitive, some things that were difficult to process, but perhaps, just maybe, the most difficult and shocking command that he gave was that you, if you belong to him, are to love your enemies and to do good to them. Now, I've been a Christian for a while, and uh, I've, I know that Christians like to have their favorite verse of Scripture their life verse or their inspiration verse. I have mine, a lot of you have yours. In all these years, I've never heard anyone say, love your enemies is my favorite verse, that it's my life verse. Uh, after all, who really wants to do that anyway? Who knows how to do that anyway? But church, are you getting, are you getting now through the, this series, are you getting that, that the point with God is that love is supreme? That love matters the most. That love for the, for the Christ follower is not optional. And that when it's all said and done, the one thing that God wants you to be known for above everything else that you're known for is how you love one another. And not just love for your family or your people, but love for him, love for your neighbor, and now even love for your enemy. So this series has been based on what Jesus told us was the greatest commandment of all the commandments that, that God gave, that we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, that we're to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. So it's important that we know how to love ourselves in a proper and Christ-honoring way so that we can love our neighbors that way. And then, in fact, as a, as a follow-up to last Sunday's message on loving your neighbor and, and, and loving them as you love yourself. Do you know that Jesus came along and raised the bar on that one? He came along and upped the ante on that. It happened on the night that he was arrested. So the setting that evening was he washes his disciples' feet. He, has the Lord's, he gives us the Lord's Supper. He calls out Judas and he tells him to go on and do whatever it is that, that he's going to do. And then he says to his disciples, he says, the time has come now for me, to be, uh, for me to be glorified. And of course, he's talking about the cross. And then they begin to walk towards the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and in that journey, he stops and he turns to his disciples. And John recorded it in John 13, beginning in verse 35. He says this, he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. To which I would imagine his disciples would have thought first, well, that's not new, Jesus. We've covered this one. You've made this one clear. It goes all the way back to the old covenant law. You've come along and said it means the most to God. And so this is not new. To which I think Jesus would have said, but wait, I'm not through. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you you. That's how I want you to love one another. I want you to love your neighbor as you love yourself, but in the same way that I have loved you, that's how I want you to love one another. So look up here. You want to know how you're supposed to love me? You want to know how I'm supposed to love you? I'm, we're supposed to love each other the same way that God loves us. And then Jesus, in the very next breath, says, says this, verse 35 of that passage, he says, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. It's like, so what is that one mark? What is that chief identifier above all others, according to Jesus, that says to others that you belong to him? Is it that you carry a Bible? Is it that you believe the Bible? Is it that you gospelize and evangelize and testify of Jesus? Is it that you go to church? Is it that you stand against certain sins? And Jesus would say, no, 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 no. All of those have their place. They have their role. But the one thing that stands above everything else is how you love one another. Love God. Love others in the same way that I love you. And then Jesus comes along and says, oh, yeah, by the way, there's, there's one more category of relationships 
There is one last category that no one has ever championed. This is a command that has never come out of any human philosophy. No world religion has ever proposed this. But I've come to deliver to you what God wants. I want you, as my followers, I want you to love your enemies. Those who oppose you and don't like you, I want you to love them. Those who don't do good towards you, I want you to do good towards them. Those people who, when they think of you, they curse you, but when you think of them, I want you to pray for them. Now, come on. What does that mean? How does that work? How in the world can I keep a commandment like that? Because here's where my mind goes. Here's where my heart goes. I mean, I know what love means because there are people that I love. So is this saying that I'm to have warm, fuzzy feelings towards somebody that I don't like or somebody that can't stand me or somebody that hates me? Does that mean that I'm supposed to feel the same way about someone who is constantly opposing me or working against me as I do about my wife or my uh, uh, son or my granddaughter? Is Jesus talking about some way that I'm supposed to feel? Because I'm telling you right now, I don't have that feeling. Or is this something that I'm supposed to do? Or is it some balance or concoction or cocktail of both of those? What in the world is it? I had a man come to me once seeking counsel for his struggling marriage. And he said, Pastor, uh, I've decided I want to divorce my wife. She's not been unfaithful. She's really not done anything bad to me. I just don't love her anymore. To which I said, well, you, you have a problem. Because the scripture says, husbands love your wives. So I'm sorry, but you don't really have an option. So I guess we're pretty much done. You can go now. And he said, no, no, you don't get it. I, I don't want to be around her anymore. I, I, don't, I don't even want to live in the same house with her anymore. So I said, well, I have an idea. Why don't you try a trial separation? Maybe six months. Let her move into the house next door, and then she'll be your neighbor. And so Jesus said that you could love your neighbor as you love yourself. How's that? And he's starting to get a little bit frustrated, and he says, you don't understand. I can't stand this woman anymore. She has become my enemy. To <laughs> which I said, this is terrific, right? I mean, Jesus says that you're to love your enemy, and you get to do good to her. So there you go, problem solved. Now, I never saw him again. That was it. And that's why I'm not a very good marriage counselor. But listen, that story, that story is only partially true, but it is based on the true facts of a whole lot of collective stories. The names were just changed to protect the guilty. But come, but come on, church. Listen, come on. Nobody ever said anything like this. And everybody who calls Jesus Lord has struggled with this one, has wondered about this one. Because on one hand, in our lives, there are people who have directly wronged us. We were the ones who were on the receiving end of their ongoing opposition, or their cheating, or their lying, or their betrayal, or their hurtful words, or their unjust actions. We were on the business end of their emotional abuse, or their physical abuse, or their sexual abuse. What was done was done to me. It was done against me. And the last thing that I could ever imagine having for them is warm, fuzzy feelings. I can't imagine feeling some kind of love feeling for that person. And then, and then, on the other hand, we have those who are indirectly opposed to us, or you oppose them. And it's like you didn't do anything, they didn't do anything, but because <clears throat> of their stand, because of the group that you're in or they're in, because of your identity, you're enemies, right? And it can be as mild and as, you know, as fun as being from opposing schools, South Caldwell, West Caldwell, and High Brighton. It can be as moderate as being in different political parties or in different religious groups, or it can be as severe as the division or the racism that is caused because of the color of your skin or because of your national identity. 
And then, and then, we've complicated it in our culture because in recent years, it's like we've created a whole new category of enemies in our culture. And you, if you're a Christian, you are right in the thick of this one. Because suddenly, if you don't subscribe to some ideologies that have never been you know, believed before, but they're being believed now, like the ideology of, of, of men are able to become women, or that you don't celebrate same-sex marriage, or if you reject the model of the privileged oppressor versus the unprivileged oppressed, now you're labeled a hater, and you are quite hated by those who do believe that. And, it, and, it's, uh, and it's not for anything that you've done. In this case, it's for what you won't do or don't do. You don't buy into the beliefs. It is a weird time to be alive. So I need to know what Jesus meant. I've got to get settled on this one. I've got to get clear on this one. How in the world are we supposed to love our enemies? Well, first of all, let's look at where Jesus said it. Matthew chapter 5 is, uh, is one of the best places. Uh, Jesus had a message that he preached when he traveled around to different towns. It's best recorded in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. There he did it on a hill, so we call it the Sermon on the Mount. So we're picking up in chapter 5, beginning in verse 43, and Jesus says this to the crowd that day. He says, you have heard it said, or it was said, that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. So just pause for a moment. If you were here last week, we actually went back and looked at the old Levitical law, Leviticus 19, where God says, I want you to love your neighbor as you love yourself, and these are the ways that you do it. And so over time, this understanding of what that meant had become simply this. The people who are like me, my people. I'm to love them like I love myself, but I'm able to hate my enemy. That's why that lawyer that day asked Jesus in response to, you know, the, to, to the conversation that we were having, so who exactly then is my neighbor? And Jesus, of course, gave the story of the Good Samaritan. And it's like Jesus says, this is what you've always heard. This is the worldview that you've lived by. This is, you know, this is what you think the Old Testament law means. But I've come to tell you that that is not what I meant when I gave it to Moses on Mount Sinai. I'm here to set the record straight. So, verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he, look at this example Jesus gives, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the unjust, just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the, let's see, what are the worst sinners you think are the worst sinners? Don't even the tax collectors do that to each other? And, verse 47, if you greet only your brothers, what more are, are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles, those without God, don't they even do the same thing? You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So Jesus is pretty clear here. He says, look, in the kingdom of God, if you want to be in the kingdom, if you're going to belong to me and you're going to name me as Lord and you're going to possess the life that I give and then the eternal life that I give as a reward for your salvation, you can simply no longer hate your enemies. Outside of the kingdom of God, that is natural, that is normal, it is what everybody believes uh, by, uh, lives by, it's intuitive. That's what those who don't know God do. But you, on the other hand, you must love your enemies. And then he, he, he argues this point. He makes reasonable statements. He says, you know, if you only love the people that love you and who are like you and who agree with you, if you're only kind and gracious or respectful or helpful to those who are like you, you're, you're just like people who've never experienced God's love in their own lives. Even the worst of sinners, the people that hate you the most and you hate the most, do that. But look at your heavenly father. Think about what he does. How does he love his enemies? Well, he, he, lets, he lets the sun shine on his enemies. He doesn't withhold it from them. He lets the rain fall on their crops. They're still his enemies, but he gives them good instead of giving them evil. And I want you to treat your enemies the way that God 
treats his enemies and the way that he treats you. And he says, so you therefore be perfect because God is perfect. And of course, the idea there of that word is not exactly what comes to our minds first. It has the idea of completeness or wholeness or, or growing into maturity. And it's as if Jesus is saying, hey, look, your next step in the kingdom of God is to grow up in this category and be complete like the Lord is love, like God is love your enemies like God does. Another place that is recorded is in Luke chapter 6. So in Luke 6, we're picking up in the middle of his teaching there in verse 27, and he says this, Luke 6, 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. So I counted four commands there. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. And then he adds something that, at least on the surface, is a little bit troublesome and has caused us some issues, but it doesn't really have to. And I'll explain it in just a moment. Verse 29, he says, to one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other cheek also. And from the one who takes away your coat, go ahead and give him your shirt too. Goes on, verse 30, give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Now you'll recognize verse 31 as what we call, come to call the golden rule, right? It's really at the essence of everything Jesus has taught. It's at the essence of loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Do unto others as you would want others to do unto you. But what about the turning the cheek thing? You know, it helps, to, uh, it helps to, to realize that you've got a little bit of, of, of language, what, we, what we'd call an idiom effect going on here, right? Because to be struck on the cheek, it, it, that could be literal or it could be figurative. Most of the time when it happens to you, it's figurative. It's simply the idea of being insulted or being offended. Something, someone says something or does something to you that is like a, we would say it like this, well, that's like a slap in the face. And, and, and so someone has done something against you. And what Jesus is essentially saying here is when someone insults you, don't insult them back. When someone does wrong to you, don't do wrong to them back. When someone does something that's evil to you, don't do something evil that is back, you know, back to them. And Jesus wasn't talking about doing nothing. For example, if someone entered your home to hurt you, I've heard Christians say, well, what does this mean? I just turn the cheek and stand there and let somebody hurt my family. No, this is not intended to be a legal strategy that if someone causes you personal damage and you just you know, live it out and do nothing, this is not intended to be a national policy if someone invades your border or bombs your country. You should defend yourself. You should protect yourself and others when it's needed. Bullies need to be stood up to at times. We all deserve self-protection. What Jesus is talking about here is a personal ethic to live by because we all know how this works. You punch me, I'm going to punch you back. And Jesus comes along and says, look, don't return insult for insult. Don't retaliate every time that you're offended. Don't be like them. Be like God is to you. Be like God is to them. It's simply a different and higher standard in my kingdom than it is in this world. It's really maturity. And then he summarized it all this way, verse 35. He said, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And in doing so, the idea there is you will be the sons and the daughters of the Most High. For this is what he does. He is kind to the ungrateful. He is kind to the evil. And so be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Simply a higher standard, a more perfect ethic to live by. So there you go. There's Jesus teaching. I get it. How in the world am I ever going to do it? Because I'm still wrestling with this thing about how I'm supposed to feel, and I can't deny the way that I feel. 
So I think the best way to unpack this is to first understand the meaning of the word love when Jesus said, I want you to love your enemy. What was he talking about? Is he talking about a feeling or an action or something in between the two? And then the second thing that I want to deal with in just a moment is a question, is a question that I know every single one of us have asked ourselves thinking about this concept or thinking about being a Jesus follower. At one time or another, we've asked ourselves or someone else this question. Can I love someone but not like them, right? You connecting with me? You done that before? Can I love someone but not like them? Is it possible to do what God wants me to do and do what is right and yet not deny these feelings that I have because of, of this conflict between me and this person? Can I love someone but still not like them? And I, think, and, and I think it's worthy of saying, and, and we've addressed this many times from time to time, especially when we deal with a topic like this, I want to make sure that you understand or the people that you love understand, God doesn't expect anyone to remain in an abusive relationship. Don't misconstrue this to read as instructions from God to, be, to allow yourself to be abused or victimized or trampled over. Get out get help. If you don't know where to go, call me. I'll help you. But loving an enemy does not mean, you know, staying in a relationship that is harmful or hurtful. And then in other cases, there are situations where it will be best where a relationship that you have or that you had is completely ended and it is never restored. And, and there are hard boundaries and clear boundaries. So sometimes that's the way that this works. Jesus isn't commanding us to stay in things that are unsafe or harmful or horribly dysfunctional. So then what is he talking about? And what kind of love is Jesus talking about when he says, <clears throat> I want you to love your enemies? Some of you have heard this before perhaps, but you know, the Greek language, which the New Testament was originally written in, <clears throat> in the Greek language, there were different words that translate into the word love. We just got one word, love, and we use it to describe our love of food, our love of kids, the love of a sunny day. You know, we just use the word, we just use the word love. There were, I think there were nine altogether in the Greek language. About four of them found their way into the New Testament. For example, I'll we'll give you some examples. The word eros, one Greek word, eros, we get our English word erotic from it. It means the romantic love or sexual love. Another word that the Greeks use is the word storge, and that, is, that described familial love, the way a mother loves her child, the way a brother loves his brother or sister. And then another is the word philos, and that made its way into the word Philadelphia. It's the brotherly love. It's really the kind of love that friends share. There's an, <clears throat> there's an attraction there. There's an affinity there. And then the one that perhaps you're most familiar with, you've seen it, heard about it, is the word agape. We'll put it a bit up on the screen. Agape. Agape love. In John 3, 16, where it says, for God so loved the world that he gave, that's the word that's used there. And then when Jesus says, I want you to love your enemy, that's the word that he used. So agape love, you could say, is the kind of love with which God loves you, and it is the love with which he loves those who do not love him in return. He loved the whole world that he gave. And so the essence of agape love is not an affinity, though God has an affinity for you. It's not an attraction. It's not a feeling. The essence of agape love is goodwill and benevolence and blessing that is shown from the, from the giver of the love to the object that is being loved. Agape love involves faithfulness, commitment, kindness. It is an act of the will. Agape love is sacrificial. Agape love gives. And agape love is doing what is right and what is best towards another person, whether there's any feeling or not. It is done when, in spite of whatever feeling or af affection or lack of affection is there. So when Jesus says, I want you to love your enemy, he's not talking about you having the warm, sappy, sentimental feeling that you have you know, towards them that you have towards your own child 
or your best friend, or for that matter, a, a sunny Saturday. Because this is not about feelings. This is not about emotions and, and affections. This is about your actions. This is about what you choose to do or what you don't do. Now hold that thought and let's deal with that question. Can, can, I, can I love someone? Can I love someone but not like them? And let's just be honest, right? There are some people, and it is impossible to like them, right? I mean, they're, they are jerks. They are beep, right? And they're mean. Or they're drama queens and drama kings or, 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 or because of what they've done or what I know they've done, I just don't feel any good feelings towards them. And then, and then, there are people, for many of you, who have legitimately harmed you. That they have done significant injustice against you. And Jesus used the word agape. So he wasn't commanding us to feel a brotherly affection towards someone that we don't like or an enemy or some deep heart attraction that I do with my son or my, my granddaughter. He simply wants me, when given the opportunity or presented the need, to do for that person what God would do for that person. That's it. He wants me to do for that person what God would do for me. And I know, I know a lot of you have heard of agape love or God's love for you defined as an unconditional love, and that's a pretty good way to say it, as long as you understand that it's this kind of love. You've heard it described as a sacrificial love, and it is that, but probably the most practical application of it and the best way to understand what agape love is in this statement right here. Agape love seeks the best for its object and chooses to do no harm. That's agape love. It seeks the best for the object on the other end of the love and it chooses to do no harm. It is not based on feeling, though it is very possible for feeling to be there. When God demonstrates his agape, when God shows his agape love towards you, he has great feelings towards you. And please get this though. This kind of love is done apart from any kind of feeling, and it is done in spite or despite of any kind of feeling. It is not a noun, it is a verb. It is not an action, it is not the, the, the uh, uh, I mean, it is not the emotion, it is an action. And it's simply when facing this person, sometimes thinking of this person, or dealing with this person, when there is a need in this person's life, I do what is benevolent towards them. I do what is right towards them. I do to them what God would do to them. I seek the best instead of seeking harm. And so the answer to the question, can I, can I love someone without liking them? And the answer to the question is yes. It is possible to love someone through the choice of your action that you take towards them and not like them maybe not even like them at all. You don't have to fake a feeling about them. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to uh, respect their point of view or their choices or their lifestyle. You don't have to acknowledge that, uh, that, that they are doing something right when they're doing wrong. You simply have to acknowledge that they're, they're somebody who's made in the image of God and what you're getting ready to do for them is what God would do for you. So again, how in the world do I turn this into a lifestyle? I mean, because this really matters to God. How do I do this and live this out in a really practical way? So I wanna give you four ways, four practical ways to help you get started. How to love your enemies. And listen, church, this applies to whether it's the family member that makes life harder for the rest of the family and for you, or this is that irrit irritating colleague at work, or this is a troublesome neighbor that is down the street, or the person or the people whose belief system is so radically different from yours that, that you even your world feels threatened by them, or if it's a legitimate enemy who has done you terribly wrong. Four things, how to love your enemies. Here's the first one, number one. This is so important. We've got to seek first 
the healing of our own hearts and our own hard hearts. You gotta seek first the healing of your own heart, the places that you've been wronged. Maybe it's by that person, maybe it's somebody else, but I'm telling you the first step in loving your enemy, and again, church, I can't emphasize this enough, Because this is also the key to being good and effective and faithful in all of your relationships, including the ones that that matter the very most to you. But the first step in, in, in loving period is finding healing for the wounds that you have in your own heart, your own brokenness, your, your own pain, your own bitterness. The feelings that you wrestle with of of inadequacy or or trying to prove myself or anger or suspicion or fear or whatever it is, those are all conditions of our own hearts and they will determine how we treat everyone that we treat. you've, You've heard the saying, hurt people hurt people. It's true. People who are hurt hurt other people. And the very first step in loving others as Christ loves you is letting God heal what is broken inside of you. Let him fix you. And that doesn't happen overnight. It's process. It's it's part of that process of sanctification where God sets you apart unto himself and his goal is to make you more like Jesus and less like the old sinful self that you are. I remind you this morning of, of the power of God to fix what is broken in you. Psalm 147, verse verse 3, it's a good one to know. It says there that God heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. God heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. God's love is the ultimate healer of your heart. And again, it is not an overnight fix, but God has designed each of us so that he is the ultimate healer of our brokenness. And so, so maybe, maybe for some of you, It's time for you to forgive someone that has badly hurt you. And I'm gonna tell you that if you've not been able to forgive them, it's because of one of two reasons. Either you don't understand what forgiveness means, and that's very common, or you've not been able to forgive them because of your own brokenness. Not theirs, but because of yours. And again, it doesn't mean that what they did, if you forgive someone, it doesn't mean that what they did is forgotten. It doesn't mean that it is downplayed and you pretend it wasn't as bad as it was. It just means that you let the offense go and you quit holding on to it so that you can walk out of the prison that that deed that was done to you keeps you in. It makes you free. But you have to trust God to believe that forgiving someone else actually works. I'll tell you, a good ethic, a good ethic to live by, a good rule for Christians to live by This works in your marriage. This works in your workplace. This works in the neighborhood. Be the first to forgive. Just be the first to forgive. In the the conflict, in the spat, in the controversy, be the first to forgive. It will go a long way towards the healing of your own heart and the healing of relationships that matter the most to you. But learning how to love your enemy starts with recognizing the pain and seeking the help that you, and the healing that you need for your own hearts. And so let God in. Get the counsel that you need. Again, if I can help you, I'll get you there. So another way, another way that we learn to love our enemies, number two, is to, is to look at each other through the lens of being made in the image of God. This is a must for Christians. We've, we've got to understand this. This is a priority that every person you encounter and the people that you don't, if if it's a human being just like you, that person is made in the image of God and loved by God, even if they are his enemies. So we need our starting point of thinking of others to be right there. And I'm telling you again, I can't say it enough, once again, this does not mean that you will like every person that you encounter or that you're gonna respect them, uh, their behavior or their point of view beyond the fact that you just simply recognize that they're made in God's image. 
I mean, God has given you a mind to discern. He's given you his word. He's given you a mind to discern to some extent people's hearts, people's motives, whether or not they're you know, living obedient to God or harmful to other people. And we should not unnecessarily put ourselves in harm's way by trusting someone who's not worthy of that trust. Even Jesus slipped away from the crowds from time to time because he knew their hearts and he did so to protect himself. However, when we place our trust fully in Christ and we pursue wisdom and holiness, that comes from God through prayer and the reading of the scripture, practicing the teachings of Jesus, letting God transform the ways that we think and live and love. We begin to supernaturally develop a love for others, a godly love. A love that that does the right thing and yet keeps healthy boundaries. Still sacrifices by seeking the best for others and yet doesn't pretend that there's some feeling in here that I just can't muster up. But that other person is made in the image of God and the mandate is that you're to love them in such a way that it mirrors and reflects the love of God and his character and the love that you have experienced in your own life. A third way that we can love our enemies is to practice empathy. Practice empathy. Empathy, of course, is simply trying to look through the other person's eyes, putting yourself in their place, walking in their shoes. The person who hurt you is a hurt person too. And practicing empathy allows the other person to be a human. And sometimes that's a good starting point instead of being the object of my anger or my attack back. And often you may be the only influence in this person's life that can point them to Jesus or to show them what he is like. And let me just add this. Let me just add this. Our world today has done a really interesting thing. We, we, we have begun promoting being a victim. Like it's a good thing to be a victim. Like a victim, you know, is someone who was powerless at the time of a wrong that was done against them. And we've created this warped system where Victims now have the most power, not the least. That if you can prove you're a victim, then the rules that govern everybody else's ethics or their rules, the rules no longer apply to you because something bad has happened to you, but you get to hold everybody else accountable to your set of rules. I simply bring that up to warn you not to fall into that and don't believe it when it's happening in your workplace and in your society. And to say this, that those of you who are in Christ, if you belong to Christ, you may well have been a victim once. You were powerless when somebody did something to you and you were the victim. But in Christ, you are no longer a victim. Not in Christ. In Christ, you are a victor. You may have been a victim then, but you can trust God with the rest of your life from this point forward. I hope you believe that. And then one final thing, number four, a fourth way, is to never seek revenge. Oh man, I was hoping he wouldn't go there at that point. I mean, you know, come on man, you punch me, I'm gonna punch you back twice as hard. Never retaliate. I know we all want to. At least get in our our word. But the essence of Jesus' teaching was this. The essence of his teaching on loving your enemy was don't go tit for tat. Don't, you know, don't retaliate. When evil is done to you, don't return evil for the evil that was done to you. Return good. Return what is right instead of what is easy. And again, I'm going to say it one final time. I'm not saying that Jesus wasn't saying you never stand up for yourself. He never said that. Or that bullies don't need to be addressed but we all know in our hearts what he's talking about when he says this, because we've had these moments when we're just waiting for the day. That set up when I'm going to encounter this person and all the right people that I want to be there are there, and I'm going to have my say, and I'm going to do my thing, and when I'm done, that low life, sorry, no good, you know what, is going to be nothing. And Jesus is like, no, you can't go there. In fact, Paul, writing in Romans 12, said this. He said, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. 
And Christian, I'm telling you, you've got to trust God on this one. God promises that every wrong done against him, which includes the wrongs done against you, will be paid for. They'll either be paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, or they'll be paid for standing before God in his judgment by that person. But you've got to let God handle the vengeance. He is so much better at it than we are. And then he goes on to say, instead of doing that, to the contrary, verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Oh, that's agape love. If, you're, if, you're, uh, if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. There's the agape love again. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. I was like, oh man, I wasn't liking this until you added that part right there, right? And then one more word. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, which is the essence of this whole teaching. And I know that burning coals thing is an interesting phrase. It's actually found first in Proverbs 25, verse 22, I think. And, but the burning coals is, an, uh, you know, it, 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 when you return, the idea is simply this, that when you return good, for evil instead of evil for evil. Suddenly the wrongdoer is alone in their wrongdoing. Suddenly the wrongdoer is alone in their shame. And few things prick the conscience of a hateful person like someone not returning the hate they were expecting, not returning the evil that they thought they had coming their way. And, uh, and God works in these situations. This is an opportunity for God to speak to their conscience. And church, the message from Jesus is pretty simple. Don't let yourself be overcome by the evil that's been done to you. Overcome that evil by doing good. Now, I know God is a realist when it comes to relationships. When we're obedient to God, things still don't work out sometimes the way that we want them to. We try and it just doesn't happen. God is pleased, but me and that person, it just, it just never got any better. Paul adds one final word in that Romans 12 passage. He says, look, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. That person, that group, that ideology, they may keep you as their enemy. But so far as it depends on you, your part, your half, your actions, your words, so far as it depends on you, if at all possible, you live peaceably with them. That is how you love your enemies. Once again, are you clear on the fact that with God, love matters the most? Let's bow for prayer. <clears throat> I'm telling you, and you know this, if you've tried it, it cannot be done in your own power. There's no way. It is first understanding what Jesus was talking about, and second, it is supernatural. It's allowing God to work where you usually don't let him, in your emotions, in your feelings, and in your choices. It is the work of the Holy Spirit in you. I mentioned earlier the, the healing of your own heart. Maybe that's the message for some of you that God wanted you to hear today. That <clears throat> your heart's not been healed. Maybe it was being healed and it, and it kind of got stopped and, 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 and the brokenness has gotten bigger or worse or it's just still there. Hey, at the end of the day, the healing of your soul, the, the mending of your brokenness, the fixing of the part of you that is not fixed will not come from a drug or a doctor or a therapist or a pastor. They have the role, they may be able to help you, but the healing of your soul and the fixing of your heart only comes from the grace of God, the love of your heavenly Father working to fix what is broken in you. So I encourage you to let him in and allow him to begin fixing what is broken. God loves his enemies and he wants us to love them the way that he does. And if you don't belong to Jesus Christ today through your personal relationship with him, you've personally put your faith in him, it's real. It's not institutional, it's real. You know him and you know that you know him. 
It may seem weird and it may seem strange and you've heard God loves you and he does, but we just explain what his love is like. If you don't belong to Jesus, you are the enemy of God. And yet God still loves you. But his love doesn't forsake judgment of your sins. There's, you, will, you will face his judgment someday. But your judgment has been received already if you want it. In the, in the person of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. He took the consequences of your sin and mine upon himself. And today, he invites you to put your faith and your trust in him and, uh, and experience the love of God. You go from being his enemy to being his friend. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for your great love for us. You have challenged us to love our enemies the same way that you do. The, the same way that you love your own enemies. You want us to love your enemies the same way that you would love us. It's really not that hard. You're not asking us to feel warm, sappy feelings. You're commanding us to do what is right and to seek the benevolence, to seek the good, to not return evil for evil, but to love our enemies the way that, that you do. There's great power in that. There's great witness in that. So, Lord, as we have a time of response and invitation, no doubt there are people here whose hearts need healing. God, would you move them to receive the healing that you have, or would you move them to the next place or the next step in that healing? And then, Lord, would you reach into some relationship today, a husband and wife, a, a broken relationship between friends or cousins or family members, and just tear down that barrier and restore that relationship or begin the process of healing and restoring. Lord, would you heal some hearts today? And then would you reach into the life of someone who's lost today spiritually and save them? May they come to repentance, putting their faith and trust in Jesus and be saved today. That's my prayer for all of us. In Jesus' great name, 